Good morning, everyone. I'm just gonna give it another minute or two, let people join. Um, I hope you all had a really nice week. I know we had some really nice weather. I got out and I did a lot of uh, removing of Japanese honeysuckle from my yard. So I, uh, <laughs> I hope you all got out too and I got to enjoy some of the sunshine. Um, and the nice weather this week. All right. All right, so I'm just gonna get started. So thank you all for joining me uh, for our Sourling Conservancy Facebook Live Steward Shop. I'm Carolyn Clauba. I'm the Sourling Conservancy Stewardship Program Coordinator. For those of you not familiar with the Sourling Conservancy, we are a very small nonprofit organization whose mission is to protect, promote, and preserve the unique character of the Sourland Mountain region here in central New Jersey. We accomplish our mission through stewardship, education, and advocacy. Please visit our website at www.sourland.org to learn more about the important history, culture, and ecology of the Sourland Mountain region and what you can do to protect it. I'd like to thank our members who make this work possible, and I would like to encourage anyone listening to become a member or to donate to help support our work. We need you to save the Sourlands. One of the educational tools we provide to our members is a steward shop. And this is an informal gathering on a Sourly Conservancy's members' property to answer questions about what they can do on their property to be a better land steward. Um, and usually this is a group setting, but because of the current situation, we're going to do it online. And members can send their questions to me, and I'll address them and email them back. So what is, this? what is stewardship? And basically stewardship is caring for our natural resources. So the land, water, plants, and animals. It can be creating and maintaining habitat, removing invasive plant species, plant and native species, stream monitoring, and so much more. So why does it matter what I do in my backyard? Well, in the Sauerland Mountain region, approximately one third of that land is privately owned and in New Jersey as a state, it's about 62% of the land in New Jersey is privately owned. So the choices that you make on your own property make a difference in the local ecosystem. So it's really, really important to be a good land steward and make good choices when you're going to be planting plants and doing any type of work on your yard. And I want to give a quick shout out to my coworkers. Lori Cleveland, Karina Rand, and Maya Robles. They're here with me virtually, um, and they'll help field questions in the comments section. Our Sourland Conservancy team is phenomenal, and I love working with these women. I just wanted to say thank you for all that you do and the wonderful support that you all uh, have given to me. So to start off this week, I want to define my terminologies and ecological concepts that we're going to be basing this stewardship or steward shop off of. So I'll be using some of the same terminologies that I used last week. So you can head over to our website at www.sourland.org slash steward shops and scroll down to the 2020 steward shops and see the one on invasive plants. Um, so you can go over any terminology that I might use today that you're not familiar with. Um, this week's terms and concepts will kind of get into the nitty gritty of as to why you want to plant native plants. You often hear people say plant native plants because they're good for the ecosystem, but you don't often get the reason why it makes a difference to plant a native plant versus a non-native plant. And all of the show notes page and terminology that we'll be posting um, on our website after this, so you can go to that steward shop page that I talked about before and look up there for any clarification. So you don't need to take any notes or anything like that. All this information will be there. Okay, 
So the first term that I want to talk about is taxonomy. And that's the branch of science concerned with the classification of organisms. And then a Latin name or a scientific name. And that's the taxonomic name of an organism that consists of the genus and species. So organisms are broken down from the largest groups to the smallest groups. So you start with a domain, and you go to kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And the genus and species are the most um, specific way that we will group an organism or, or a plant or an animal or anything like that. We usually use the genus and species to indicate what we're talking about. Um, and scientific names are really important because common names can change from region to region, but the scientific name is the same across the world. So if I say black birch or sweet birch, it's the same thing. It's it, The Latin name is Betulolenta, but depending where you are, you might call it something different. Same thing if we say touch me not versus jewelweed, it's still the same plant in Patience Compensis. Um, and that's going to be the same name here in the United States as it is in Germany, as it is in China. The Latin or scientific name is always the same. So when you're going to go out and you're going to buy a plant, check the label. They should always have the common name and the scientific name. And the scientific name is usually underneath the common name, and it's usually italicized, and that's the way to tell the difference. Nectar. Nectar is a sugary fluid secreted by plants, especially within flowers to encourage pollinators, um, such as insects and other animals, to come to that plant. Um, and nectar is what bees collect to create honey. Um, pollen, that's a fine powdery substance consisting of microscopic grains um, discharged from the male part of a flower or a male cone, and each grain contains a male gamete that can fertilize um, the female ovule. A pollinator is any organism that helps carry pollen from one plant or one flower to another flower. So this can be birds, butterflies, bees, moths, bats, ants, beetles, flies. There's many, many different organisms that are pollinators. And pollination is just the transfer of pollen to allow for fertilization. And there are two main um, mechanisms of pollination. There's self-pollination and cross-pollination. And this is important because self-pollination is the pollination of a flower by pollen from the same flower or to another flower on the same plant. Because a plant can self-pollinate, it will not invest the same amount of energy it takes into producing quality nectar to attract pollinators. So not all flowers are created equal. Cross-pollination is a transfer of pollen from one flower on one plant to another flower of a different individual of the same species. And there's three modes for that. There's water pollination, hydrophily, and these plants generally have non-showy flowers, and the pollen of these flowers are adapted to float on water. Then there's wind pollination, anemophily, and these are also non-showy flowers, and the pollen is really light and sometimes winged. And uh, wind pollinated plants are kind of the bane of everybody's seasonal allergies. Um, these plants produce a lot of pollen and they put all their energy into creating a lot of pollen because the pollen just blows in the wind. Um, so in end of August, beginning of September, when you see all that goldenrod, those big yellow flowers, and you think that's causing your seasonal allergies, it is not. That plant with the big showy yellow flowers as an animal pollinated plant because it's colorful and showy because it wants to bring pollinators to it. The plant that's causing your allergies is probably ragweed, which is a smaller plant, and it has yellowish green flowers that are very, very small and inconspicuous, but it produces tons and tons of pollen, but they're both blooming at the same time. So when we're thinking about our plants, um, Different plants are going to have different flowering and different pollination strategies depending on how they're getting pollinated. So animal pollination is called zoophily, and that pollen of that plant is adapted to stick to the body of the pollinator. And in general, they have very showy flowers that are sweet smelling and produce nectar to attract the pollinators. 
and they can have really large stigmas and anthers that the pollinators can perch on when they're gonna go feed on that nectar. So the next thing I wanna talk about are symbiotic relationships. So a symbiosis is a close relationship between two species in, in which at least one species will benefit. And there's three different basic types of symbiosis. There's mutualism. A mutualism is when both species benefit. So animal pollinated plants was a great example of this. The plant is pollinated and then the animal gets nectar. So both animals are benefiting from that relationship. There's commensalism where one species benefits but the other one is, is not negatively impacted. So that could be a tree frog climb out a tree, tree doesn't care the tree frog's there, but the tree frog gets protection from that tree or a bird nesting on a branch of a tree. Again, the tree doesn't care that the bird is there, but the bird is using the tree for its benefit. And the last type of a symbiosis is a parasitism. So that's when one species benefits, but the other one is negatively impacted. So you can think of ticks and mosquitoes there, more of a parasitic type of relationship with us. Within these relationships, you can have an obligate relationship or facultative relationship. So an obligate relationship is when one or both species depend on each other for survival. So that could be that a flower has to be pollinated by one specific type of pollinator or this animal only eats this one other type of plant. And you can have a facultative relationship where one or both species can utilize um, different pollinators or they can pollinate different flowers and gain their energy that way. So some species are a general species where they have a wide variety of environmental conditions or a wide and varied diet um, and some are not, some are obligate. So one of the last concepts I want to talk about is phenology. And phenology is the study of seasonal changes in plants and animals from year to year, such as when the flowering of plants, the emergence of insects, and the migration of birds. And this especially relates to the timing of the relationships with weather and climate. So the phenophase, that's the observable phase in the annual life cycle of a plant or an animal that can be defined from a start and an end point. So if you want to think about this in the sense of when a flower blooms and produces nectar, or when birds are migrating back. And why this is important is because of co-evolution and all these really intricate relationships um, that I kind of just went through with the pollinators and with an, with an obligate or a mutualistic relationship is that a lot of the animals and plants that are here co-evolved with each other. And the term co-evolution is used to describe cases where two or more species reciprocally affect each other's evolution. So for example, an evolutionary change in the morphology or the shape of a flower might affect morphology and the shape of the pollinator that utilizes that plant. And so evolution takes a really, really long time. We're talking thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, maybe even longer. Um, for these relationships and these um, processes to take place. And so these native plants and animals have evolved with each other and they have, some of them have really tight fitting relationships where only one pollinator can pollinate this one particular plant. Um, and so even though there are general species, the non-native plants that are here might not necessarily give those general species the nutrient requirements that they need. Um, and so when we're gonna be going through and we're thinking about what we're gonna be doing in our backyard, we wanna keep those things in mind that not every flower is equal. Not every flower will produce quality nectar. A lot of times if a cultivar, which is, um, a variety of a plant that's been crossbred by humans that have certain characteristics. It might have a really big showy flower, but due to this crossbreeding of from humans artificially changing the genetics of these plants, it might not produce quality nectar for a pollinator. So you might have these really big beautiful blooms out in your yard, 
but it doesn't do anything for the for the butterflies and for the hummingbirds and anything else. So, you know, you really want to choose native plants because they're adapted to live in this region. The animals and pollinators are adapted to use them specifically. Um, and also because native plants are adapted to live in this region, they don't need the same type of boost that you would have to give uh, ornamental. So they use virtually no fertilizer um, and they'll require less water than if you go out and you buy a non-native or some cultivar. So um, again, really try to be mindful when you're going to be going out and, and making these choices to plant native plants in your land of thinking of it as not just I'm going to put some flowers out, but I want to pick flowers that are really going to support my local ecosystem. So on that note, we're going to jump into our steward shop. So Emily and Jared um, are longtime Sourland Conservancy members, and they're interested in creating a hummingbird haven on their property, which they want to enjoy from their dining room table. And so when we're going to think about creating a habitat for hummingbirds, we need to think about what does a hummingbird need? Well, they need a home. A place to nest, they need water, and they need food, just like us. So I'm not an ornithologist, um, but I luckily know one. I reached out to a local bird expert and member of the Sireland Conservancy, Juanita Hummel, and she works closely with Washington Crossing Audubon. And I asked her about what species of hummingbirds we have in New Jersey, and also what specific needs a hummingbird would need to have. Um, to thrive in our backyard. So Juanita guided me through some of the specific needs of hummingbirds. She also provided some really gorgeous pictures of ruby-throated hummingbirds for you to see. Thank you, Juanita, for your time and expertise. Uh, so again, if you go to our website, www.sourland.org slash steward shops, and go to the steward shop on hummingbird, you can see the pictures that uh, Juanita provided to us. So we only have one species of hummingbird that is regularly found and breeds in the eastern part of the country, and that's the ruby-throated hummingbird. Occasionally you might have a rufous hummingbird that comes here in the fall, but it's considered an accident that they arrived here. Um, hummingbirds will return to the same place where they hatched, and they'll return to the same feeders that they know are there, and they'll go to those same feeders on their way to and back from their migration. So if you're gonna be putting out a feeder for a hummingbird, make sure to do it regularly and keep it in the same place and keep it clean and filled. Uh, in addition to uh, having these feeders, it's really great to have plants because plants don't have legs so they don't move. So they'll always be there. So choose plants. Uh, <laughs> hummingbirds make impossibly tiny nests on branches of deciduous trees, and they use lichen in the construction of these nests, and each nest will hold two eggs. Hummingbirds get all the water they need from nectar that they obtain from flowers, but they do enjoy a good shower, and they usually take one when it's raining. Um, but if it's a really, really hot day, they might go and zip right through a sprinkler or a fountain. Um, hummingbirds are attracted to red and deep pink, even if they're on people's clothing. So I don't know if you've ever been flirted with by a hummingbird. Um, I have, and it's pretty wild. It's fun. Um, those birds are just incredible. So um, when you're going to be thinking about plants for your hummingbird and your hummingbird haven, you want to pick a variety of plants that have different bloom times. So again, think of our phenophase. This is important because not all flowers are going to be in bloom at the same time. So you don't want to provide food and attract your hummingbird to your property and only provide food for them for a month. So we're going to talk about a couple of different plants and each of them bloom along a different part of their season. Um, and all the species that I'm going to be talking about today are perennials. So we're not going to be planting new ones every year. I want to give a quick shout out to Marianne Borge. She is a member and volunteer of the Sourland Conservancy for her wonderful photography skills and sharing her photos with us. She writes a blog with loads of information on native plants and wildlife. So you should check her out at thenaturalweb.org. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any live plants this week to show you because 
most of these plants, there's nothing really to see right now. They're not blooming. But uh, Marianne shared some photos with us. And I also want to give a shout out to Wild Ridge Plant Nursery for letting us use some of their photos as well. They are one of our favorite plant nurseries to work with. And the owners, Jared and Rachel, have been longtime members of the Sourland Conservancy. They're a great resource for knowledge and they carry local ecotypes of our native plants. So please make sure to check them out at wildridgeplants.com. All right. So if you go to our steward shop page for native plants, I'm going to talk about all the plants um, that are listed there. Um, and the first one is trumpet creeper. And trumpet creeper blooms almost all season, all flowering season long, so from June to September. Um, it's a vine, and it has really beautiful orange red flowers and really luscious dark green leaves. Um, it's a really lovely looking plant, but it's aggressive and borderline invasive. So I know last week I said most invasive plants are non-native, but native plants can be invasive and trumpet creeper is one of them. Um, it is beautiful, it is spreading. So if you are gonna plant it, just be aware that it's something that you're gonna have to really stay on top of because it's gonna wanna spread everywhere. But it is a hummingbird magnet. The next one is trumpet honeysuckle and it blooms July to August. Uh, this is where your scientific names come in really, really important. There's another very common honeysuckle called Japanese honeysuckle. Trumpet honeysuckle is our native one, and the Latin name is Lanisra sempervirens. And the invasive non-native honeysuckle is Lanisra japonica. So when you're going to go out and you're going to purchase a honeysuckle, and especially if you're not going to a local plant nursery where the people that work there are really familiar with their plants, make sure to check the label. You don't want to go out and buy a Japanese honeysuckle. You want to make sure that you get our native trumpet honeysuckle. Um, and honestly, I think the trumpet honeysuckle or the coral honeysuckle, it's different common names, same plant, Linusura sempervirens. The flowers are just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. The leaves are really interesting. It's a great plant. Um, so again, just check your label, make sure you know what you're getting. The next one is red cardinal flower, and that blooms July to August. And cardinal flower is in a symbiotic relationship with hummingbirds. The hummingbird gets its nectar from the cardinal flower, and cardinal flower is exclusively pollinated by hummingbirds. Um, this plant will do great in the sun or the shade. It'll get even bigger if it's in the sun, but it's a great choice. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. So especially if you have a shady place where you want to plant, um, a hummingbird garden, red cardinal flower is a great choice. Scarlet bee balm. Um, scarlet bee balm is a must for any hummingbird enthusiast. Hummingbirds love it, and so will many other pollinators. And a benefit of scarlet bee balm is that it's in the mint family, and deer generally leave it alone. So that one blooms June to August. Columbine. I love columbines. I love, love, love columbines. I've never had the privilege of seeing it in the wild, but I think if I did, I'd probably get down and kiss the ground that it came out of. I mean, this plant is just, when you, when you see it, you just, your mind is blown of how it could be so intricate and it's just absolutely stunning. Um, it's just, you're not gonna regret it. You're not gonna regret it. <laughs> it's one of the earlier blooms, so you can start your spring off right with this gorgeous little plant. Check it out. Um, Love me some columbines. Okay, and so the last one that I'm gonna recommend is tulip poplar. And this is a very, very large tree, and it blooms May to June. So if you have the room to plant some trees, please do it. Uh, I talked in the beginning of the steward shop about, you know, obligate species and, and general species and trees are really, I feel like they're neglected in the conversation of pollinators. Um, trees host a tremendous amount of pollinator species, not just for their flowers, but also for their structure, what they, what they provide. So oak trees, like the white oak, will host, I think, something around 400 different species of caterpillars. I mean, they're just such a huge resource for pollinators. Um, and insects. So please don't forget about trees when you're thinking about your pollinators. Tulip poplar is a wonderful tree. It's a really, really big tree, but it grows straight up. It's a straight body. Um, 
it has really pretty flowers in the top of the canopy um, and those fruits eventually will come down the little uh, keens will trickle on down to the ground it's just a really lovely plant if you have the space to plant it I would definitely plant it it's just it's wonderful and I don't think deer bother it that much especially if you're a young one you would still want to protect it but it's not one of the favorite of deer so again just to wrap up on that steward shop is make sure that you are planting flowers that are blooming across the whole season from may to the end of uh, to the end of august beginning of september because that's when the hummingbirds are here and plant native plants and talk to your local plant nursery for great options that would work on your property. So I had two questions this week. Uh, the first question was from Margaret and she wants to know what she could plant to replace her Bradford pears. So Bradford pear is a really common non-native ornamental tree used for plantings around homes and on streets and it's become really invasive and it's pushed out many other native plant species. So if you're able to remove your Bradford pear, some other small to medium sized native trees that are great for spring flowers are black cherry, which is Prunus serotina, flowering dogwood, Cornus florida, eastern redbud, Circus canadensis, and sweet bay magnolia, magnolia virginiana. They're all wonderful, have really pretty showy flowers and it's a great choice. And then Bill asked me, if there's a way to get native plants at a reduced rate. So yes, there are some nonprofit organizations such as Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space, which allows members to purchase plants at bulk prices twice a year. So folks who are interested in joining uh, Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space or Phobos, uh, in order to take advantage of the native plant sale, you can email M Van Clef, M-V-A-N-C-L-E-F, at phobos.org. The plant sale is not restricted to people living within a certain area, but there is no delivery. So you're going to have to go down to Hopewell to get your plants. Membership is $50. They have, they just had their spring plant sale, but they're going to have a fall plant sale as well. Um, and if you become a member, you'll be notified of when the plant sale is. I want to thank everyone for joining me today and encourage anyone that's listening to help us save the Sourlands by donating to the Sourland Conservancy or becoming a member. You can do that at our website at www.sourland.org. You can also check out our blog uh, where I go out on hikes or other folks go out on hikes and they take pictures and they write about it at www.sourlandniche.blog. Um, and if you're a member of the Sourland Conservancy and you'd like to, me to answer your questions about backyard stewardship, you can email me at sourlandstewards at sourland.org. I hope you'll have a wonderful and healthy weekend and stay safe.